Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Felipe Rojas. I am a professor of archaeology here at the Tchaikovsky Institute and in the Department of Egyptology and Assyriology. I'm very happy to welcome all of you and to introduce to you uh, <coughs> Professor Carolina Lopez Ruiz, who teaches at Ohio State University and who is the author of many articles and several books, including the recent Tartesos and the Phoenicians in Iberia, about which you'll hear more uh, in a minute. But Carolina is also the author of two other books that many people in this room know intimately well. <laughs> Some of you read them, and this is no exaggeration, daily. Oh or anyway, yeah. <laughs> you should read them daily. <laughs> you are taking my class. I refer to her uh, erudite and meticulous when the gods were born, Greek cosmogonies in the Near East, and more directly to gods, heroes, and monsters, a source book of Greek, Roman, and Near Eastern myths and translations. The first of those books, When the Gods Were Born, uh, was published in 2010, and it situated ancient Greek mythology, which had long been studied in ideal and somewhat soul-numbing isolation, within the vibrant and often turbulent cross-cultural dynamics of the ancient Eastern Mediterranean. By juxtaposing familiar and mysterious texts, such as Hesiod's Theogony or the Orph Orphic Cosmogonies, with her Northwest Semitic counterpart, she shed light on the manner and the intensity of cultural interaction, and also on the myths themselves. And then, after the publication of the fabulous anthology Gods, Heroes, and Monsters, anyone who is interested in ancient mythology can witness just how twisting and knotted and snarling and coiling and ultimately entangled the mythological traditions of the ancient Mediterranean and Near East are. Professor Lopez Ruiz obtained her PhD from the University of Chicago. She did graduate work at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and her BA and MA at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. She is a bold and innovative scholar who is attentive to academic conversations well beyond those narrowly associated with the classics. The work on this talk, uh, the work for this talk is based uh, in part on the project Phoenician Networks in the Mediterranean from Greece to Iberia, which was funded by an NEH grant under the Humanities in the Public Square initiative. Please join me in welcoming <coughs> Professor Lopez Ruiz. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you to the Jarkovsky Institute for, for making it possible for me to come, and uh, for the colleagues of the departments of Assyriology and Egyptology and Classics, and anybody who's uh, supported this visit, and especially to Felipe Rojas uh, and to his students, who, <laughs> um, for good or for bad, are victims of my, <laughs> of my work. And I really look forward to our discussion uh, tomorrow in, in class. I think it's going to be uh, stimulating and, and interesting, I hope, for, for everybody. There are very few places where I would be so looking forward to visit as, as Brown, since there are many colleagues here whom I had not met in person, but whose works I admire, and others that I have met, and, and so on. So this is really a treat for me. So I, I hope I will have a little bit for, for everyone um, background, forgive me if I'm going to say things that you already know. I hope I will have, you know, old things and new things for, <laughs> for every, everyone. So let me start um, by saying that my, my ongoing research, um, looking forward to, to, my, to my next monograph, uh, keeps exploring the cultural exchange be behind the pan-Mediterranean uh, trend know that known as the orientalizing phenomenon, which you can hear uh, with quotation marks most of the times I say it or not, I'll talk about it uh, in a bit. I inquire first of all what we may gain from comparing the cases of the different indigenous cultures involved and what their articulations of the oriental tastes and idioms tell us of their responses to Phoenicians and others. Second, I interrogate the different ways in which local histories are written with an eye to how they treat differently uh, the Semitic element, Phoenicians, Levantines and others, depending on national narratives 
and scholarly agendas. Art historians have introduced the, ca the category of orientalizing <coughs> into classical studies in order to label Greek artifacts that exhibited Near Eastern slash Oriental uh, motifs and patterns, especially particular types of vase decoration and sculpture. Uh, I think it was first introduced for, our, for Etruscan art. As our knowledge of the pre-classical period grew, the term was more broadly used for an all-encompassing phenomenon in the late geometric and early archaic periods of the Iron Age, not only in Greece or Etruria, but, but in other areas of the Mediterranean. So more or less the 8th and uh, 7th centuries BCE is, where, is when the period I'm, I'm going to be talking about. The bibliography by now is pretty vast and reflects a growing interest in this aspect of Mediterranean cultures. The trend, this orientalizing trend, is most easily identifiable in the visual arts, yes, obviously. Ubiquitous sphinxes, lotus flowers, griffins that decorate Greek objects, represent it very well, but orientalizing aesthetics were the product of a contact between cultures that led to a broader technological and literary revolution. And that is what my other, the other part of my work uh, is dedicated to, that is uh, contacts across uh, literatures, mythological traditions, and so on. For the cultures where we have literatures, we can trace that aspect of the Near Eastern and Western <laughs> contact. The term has been declared infelicitous, however, from various fronts. It does not help that it has been used in rather inconsistent way and confusing way. For instance, we may see orientalizing used to label a historical period even in Greece. Of course, this is a scholarly convention as all periods are, hist yeah, and historical periodizations are uh, conventions, but it can be used uh, in addition to or overlapping with other more common names for the same period, like Iron Age, Geometric Period, which is a form of art also, Archaic, Proto-Historic, and so on. Furthermore, the orientalizing label is not necessarily attached to a single culture, but is rather a phase of experimentation and change within several Mediterranean peoples. I turn to one of them first, and, which is Tartessos, um, and uh, to, I will try to illustrate the kinds of entanglements that surrounds these orientalizing uh, cultures and the role of the Phoenicians in this theater of interaction. <coughs> then I will uh, discuss a bit more my ideas about uh, the concept of, of the orientalizing. So Tartessos uh, flourished between the 8th and 6th centuries BCE in the Guadalquivir Valley which is the green area around that river uh, in southwestern and southern Spain. And uh, it flourished between the 8th and the 6th centuries, a region uh, that, was transi uh, that transitioned from the Late Bronze Age, as many other areas in Europe, they transitioned from the la their Late Bronze Age into the Iron Age much later than this happened in the Levant. And it, this happened just as they joined the Eastern Mediterranean networks with the incoming of uh, the Phoenician uh, colonists. Regarding Tartessos, the pendulum of Spanish scholarship has fluctuated between various essentialist positions, from defining it as pure in purely indigenous terms to, defining it, to identifying it squarely with the Phoenician colonial populations. These positions have generally followed the shift in self-representation among Spaniards of different generations. So, for instance, the more indigenous, uh, the indigenous elements that have Atlantic or Celtic or North African inflections are more desirable within discourses of regional history and nationalisms, while the international cosmopolitan aspects associated with the Phoenicians are more in tune with a pan-Mediterranean European image of the peninsula. The Phoenician element, in turn, can be used <coughs> in different ways. It can be inflected as foreign, colonial, or it can be inflected as our own, much as the Islamic or Jewish uh, pasts in Spain. That can be also used in, in both ways. And to this we can add a classicizing or Indo-European 
emphasis that some scholars adhere to or cling to and that has deep roots in the early archaeology of Tartessos as well, for those who are more anchored in the classical uh, tradition. A middle ground <laughs> position predominates now, I would say, or we're getting there, one that reads the orient orientalizing materials along the lines of post-colonial discourse, and Tartessos as the result the interac of the interaction and interdependence of both indigenous and colonial strata or groups. The difficulties of finding consensus among the scholarly community, among also among archaeologists, historians, philologists, epigraphists, and so on, is clear when you attend a, con a congress, a conference about Tartessos. There is very little consensus in many ways. In the last congress in 2011 in Huelva, uh, the main organizers came up with a manifesto for Tartessos. I, I, that's how it was called. <laughs> I thought it was. I think it's funny. And the, the essential part of it says, Tartessos is the... Co and sorry, but they made us sign it. I mean, we had to sign... <laughs> I mean, they circulated the manifesto <laughs> and we actually signed the manifesto and it was included in the volume of, uh, of the conference as... as which tells you the, the kind of the anxiety that surrounds the topic and, and the, the willingness to, to really reach some kind of consensus of how to define this thing called Tartessos, right, from different angles, because it seems hard that, and it's still with the manifesto, I'm not sure there is one, but it reads, uh, Tartessos is the culture of the southwestern of the Iberian Peninsula coinciding with the stable Phoenician presence. This confluence results in the brilliance and wealth evoked in the Greek sources by the name of Tartessos and perhaps under the name Tarshish in the Hebrew Bible, which is not <coughs> certain, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> <laughs> the, oops, um, the archaeological evidence points, I can read, I can see, I don't, I don't mind. The archaeological evidence points to a great demographic diversity resulting from said confluence ranging from centers of direct Phoenician foundation, these colonies, joined by autochthonous contingents to pre-existing centers, which then incorporate Phoenicians. The result in most cases is that of juxtaposed or hybrid communities in which diverse languages are also attested. It's pretty progressive for <laughs> where we were at. So what is this brilliance and wealth evoked in the Greek sources? I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Greek sources for the classicists. Up until the 1960s, yeah, the 1960s or so, our knowledge of Tartessic culture was based almost exclusively on literary allusions. Were it not for the presence of Tartessos in the classical sources, archaeologists would not have looked for it in the first place. Some of the pioneering archaeologists worked on it uh, actually at the beginning of the century and started looking in, in the archaeological record for this entity that appear in classical sources. These are Adolf Schulten and Eduard Bonsor. Uh, these are our Schliemanns, right? They were doing this at the same time as the, the discovery of ancient Greece was happening. I want to give you, this is Bonsor, <coughs> a, a few insights on the place of Tartessos in the, in the sources, just zooming in only on those that contain more direct information. Tartessos is first mentioned by, um, I mean, as a river, so the river that is now the Guadalquivir, uh, and later the Baetis of the Romans, apparently, it's almost certainly, that was the river called Tartessos. So it's mentioned as a river by the poet Stesichorus of, Hi of Himera in the 7th or early 6th century. He's situated in the far west Heracles victory over the monster Gerion. A century or so later, the Ionian poet Anacreon is attributed uh, a verse that reads, and this is in, in your handout in the number three, if you want, but anyway, if you want the reference, the, they are there. I myself would not want the horn of Amalthea, nor for a hundred and fifty years to be king of Tartessos. It's a, a, a fragment uh, recorded by Strabo. But Tartessos appears early on in the Ionian geographical tradition, mentioned by Hecateos of Miletos around the turn of the 5th century. 
The preserved quotations of Hecateos, which are fragmentary, provide a number of allusions to areas around the Straits of Gibraltar or the columns of Heracles. Among these, two, uh, three, uh, two or three regions stand out, three, Mastienoi, Tartessos, and Iberia. So it sounds like Tartessos is a separate territory than Iberia, which would be in the east, Tartessos in the southwest. And these uh, regions contain a number of cities. So it's sim sim seemingly it's clearly, a, well, seemingly it's a region. But Herodotus is, of course, the crucial source for Tartessos. We owe to him the only two appearances of Tartessos within a historical narrative prior to Roman times. During his account of the Persian subjugation of the Greeks of Asia Minor, the historian tells us about the, this following story about the Phocians the Pho in Ionia. This is uh, also in your hand on number one, but I'm going to read it. So, Phocia was the first Ionian town that he, the Persians, the Persian general, attacked. These Phocians were the earliest of the Greeks to make long sea voyages, and it was they who discovered the Adriatic Sea, Tyrrhenia, Iberia, and Tartessos. Not only sailing in round freight ships, but in 50 oared vessels. When they came to Tartessos, they made friends with the king of the Tartessians, whose name was Argantonios. He ruled Tartessos for 80 years and lived 120. Hence, that fame <coughs> that is uh, reflected by Anacreon. The Phocaeans won his ma this man's friendship to such a degree that he in invited them to leave Ionia and settle in his territory, where, wherever they liked. And then it goes on to say that uh, since they didn't stay, he gave them money to build walls in their city, uh, archaic walls, that, uh, maybe the archaic walls that are uh, actually there still, part of, part of them, to defend themselves from the Persians. Right after this, he tells us how the Persians besieged the city and the Phocians fled and their empty city was taken. Failing to acquire territory in the immediate islands of the coast, Herodotus tells us the Phocians prepared to sail to, sail to Kyrnos, that is Corsica, where at the command of an oracle they had built a city called Alalia 20 years before. Argantonios by this time had already died. So he gives us a pretty nice chronology there. Other mention of Tartessos by Herodotus uh, is in Book 4, where he narrates the foundation of Cyrene. Uh, by the people from Thera, right, in, uh, when they s found Cyrene in Libya. In a digression from this story, he tells about this Samian merchant called Colaios, who helped the Therans <coughs> stranded in Libya with supplies. Colaios told them a story that most likely reached Herodotus via Samian oral tradition, how the merchant accidentally passed through the pillars of Her Heracles and came providentially to Tartessos. Now, he said, this was at the time an unexploited market, a Keratos Emporion. Hence, the Samians, of all the Greeks whom we know with certainty, obtained the greatest profit from their cargo. What follows represents vividly the presence of orientalizing artifacts in sanctuaries. The sailors dedicated a tenth of their profit at the Samian Herion in the form of a monumental bronze vessel with projecting griffin heads supported by three colossal kneeling figures of bronze that we cannot figure out how that would have worked. Indeed, places like the Samian Herion, just like, uh, like Olympia you know, the, uh, or, or other sanctuaries, function as nodal points for trade and transnational uh, relations. These references in Hecateos and Herodotus are the closest we get to the historical Tartessos of the 7th and 6th centuries that is, to the, uh, the archaeological horizon of this sort of orientalizing culture that the archaeologists um, have identified as Tartessos. More specifically, uh, Herodotus, uh, going back to the walls, the, uh, the Phocaean encounter that he tells us about must belong in the mid-6th century, according to the, you know, the calculations, <laughs> more or less, before the, dec the decrease in population and wealth that archaeologists notice after the 6th century in the Tartessic territory. They talk about a 6th century crisis in Tartessos that nobody knows uh, you know, 
what was it uh, caused by. This scenario includes a decline in direct Greek presence in the southwest, possibly related possibly to the increasing rivalry between Carthaginians and Greeks, especially Phocians, who had settled in Massalia and northeastern Iberia. They were competing to dominate the Western <coughs> Mediterranean and the Atlantic market markets. The obscure Battle of Alalia that Herodotus mentions <coughs> later may be symptomatic of this clash of interests, but it's not clear that this is the direct cause of the decline of Tartessos. Now, in the 5th century and 4th centuries, Iberian and the Iberians take a place in the literary allusions of classical sources, joining Tartessos, Gadeira, Gadir, Ericeia, and other places in mythical connections with Gerion, the Hesperides, which you know are kind of movable, the pillars of Heracles, those are not movable, <laughs> and the landscape of the Western world by the end of the ocean even an entrance to the underworld is situated there and all that. This mythical landscape had been evoked since Homer and Hesiod and frequently even, even in Pindar among other archaic poets, but it acquired more real contours. So the Iberian lands, which are the eastern part of the peninsula, were connected with Greek colonies, uh, you know, uh, Catalonia, southern France. They became the point of reference for the Greeks while Tartessos in the southwest becomes less immediate of a reference and gets kind of lost. Possibly again because access to the area uh, beyond the straits may now have been under the control of Carthage, so kind of cut off from the Greek world. We have a noticeable, noticeable gap in references to Tartessos in the third century, fourth and third, until the Romans enter Iberia in chase of the Carthaginian rivals during the Second Punic War, that is, at the end of the third century. What do we find then? This is interesting in terms of the trying to figure out if there was an identity in this area attached to, to Tartessos. To make a long story short, in the area where Tartessos flourished, we have now the, what the Romans called Tour de Tania. Um, after a few centuries of scarce uh, direct documentation, Polybius account of the Punic Wars marks a turning point. This is the time when the Romans take control not only of the territory but of the intelligence about the region, becoming mediators even in the selective transmission of previous Greek and Carthaginian sources about the West. Some scholars want to see in this Tour de Tani a new culture emerging after the crisis of Tartessos and disconnected from it, not as a continuation of whatever Tartessos was. I agree more with those who see this as two uh, almost coterminous names, one used by Greeks, Tartessos, the other used by Romans, Tour de Tani, for the same area and possibly for the same people. <coughs> so Polybius, Diodorus, Siculus, Livy and Strabo all mention one or the other, depending on which ethnographic tradition they're following, and that's something I explore in my uh, Tartessos book. That seems pretty clear. They never occur ju in juxtaposed position. But the choice of different names and ambivalence about their ethnic content is not just the result of the reception of Greek ethnography in Rome. There are other factors. For instance, the ancient Greek name was uh, cherished by the Roman inha inhabitants of Gadir and the Turdetania area themselves in Roman times. So it doesn't disappear completely, but they kind of reinvent it or reuse um, it as a prestigious ancestral ethnonym. So the name had an aura, an aura imprinted in it by a past that they are aware of and by Greek sources as well. Anyway, that's a long story. But in, the, in, in geographical uh, writing in any way, Tartessos continues to be a productive concept, as I said. <coughs> right. And this includes uh, the Carthaginian and Massaliot periploi as well, for those interested in Carthaginian things. A crucial author, of course, the last one I'm going to explore a little bit is Strabo, writing ar around the time of uh, Augustus, in the first century CE, I mean, a bit later. Strabo refers abundantly to the Tartessians as a people whose illustrious past serves as backdrop for the contemporary Romanized Tour de Tani. 
who, which seems to refer to the area around Cadiz. Okay? And, but by extension, Tarteso seems to be also applied to the broader region of uh, Betica. So Strabo, like others, draws distinctions between these Tartessioi and the old Phoenician colonies. That's what's interesting, especially Gadir and Gades. So somebody from Gadir could say playfully, like Columela, say that he cultivates Tartessian lettuces, which is like, I have Tartessian, you know, just weird things like that. But we know he's from Gadir, and in Roman times, Gadir is, well, it's a Roman city, but if, but <laughs> if there is a concept of the past is more linked to the Phoenicians, no? So there is a really complex combination of things. So, uh, Strabo is also the one who tells us the story of the foundation of Gadir. This is in, uh, in your handout number four. The Gaditans report that a certain oracle commanded the Tyrians, right, the Phoenicians from Tyre, to found a colony by the pillars of Hercules. In the third voyage, after two failed attempts, they reached Gades and found the temple, that is the temple of Melkart, in the eastern part of the island and the city in the west. There are very few like, uh, sites that so much resemble their mother colony <laughs> as Gadir resembles the island of Tyre. And they mirror each other also having uh, a temple of Melkart, that that both of which were famous in antiquity. So whatever the accuracy and historicity of this account, it illustrates how local traditions in early imperial times preserve the memory of a Phoenician origin distinct from, even if subsumed into, the Tartessian provi provincial ethnonym and with um, adding some indigenous color to, to whatever Roman identity was the prevalent one. Strebo also gives voice to what must be the general tradition underlying many of our Roman sources. The Tour de Tani occupy the country where the ancient Artesians uh, were, he says it just like that. And uh, he also makes a hyperbolic assertion, I guess, that they had chronicles and poems of ancient tradition and versified laws 6,000 years old, which again drives home the idea of an old, sophisticated local civilization that was not equivalent to the Phoenician one and the Romans and then the Romans identified with what the Greeks identified as Tartessos. Did you follow that? <laughs> More or less. And the last thing about the sources is that Strabo then keeps complicating the picture uh, by making further observations about these different layers of identities. For instance, he says, a number of the greater number of cities from Tour de Tania, that would be this, all this area again, are now inhabited by Phoenicians, since they had become utterly subject to them since remote times. Or he says that the Phoenicians occupied the best of Iberia and Libya before the time of Homer, and continued to be the masters of those regions until Roman times, until the Romans broke up their empire. In other words, he, he draws a distinction between the older Phoenician colonization and the Carthaginian domination, as well as other waves of North African Punic peoples, right? So different layers of Phoenicians, in a sense. So just that was to have some background about the, you know, well, about the sources, but uh, there are tons and tons of sources, really. Um, so at some point, there was a movement to archaeologize, <laughs> to focus on the archaeology of Tartessos. And this turning point was in the 1950s, when you, we have the very famous finding of a treasure called the treasure of El Carambolo. This gold stash was found by chance under a pigeon shooting club. In, yes, we have those in Spain too. <laughs> in 1958, <laughs> and it immediately sparked interest in Tartessos. That again, remember that before that, very little archaeology had been done on, on it. It even sparked a feeling of national pride that has only grown, especially in Andalusia, right, in, the, in southern Spain. You have Tartessos everywhere, hotels, uh, mining companies. Let us not forget that in the following decades, 
after the 60s, but especially in the 70s, archaeology served the interests of regional autonomies seeking self-definition after the Franco regime. More systematic excavations in the region followed, <coughs> revealing a rich indigenous culture in the Guadalquivir Valley and its surrounding hinterland. Its core, the core of it was this kind of this triangle that you see up close here, uh, kind of a triangle demarcated by Huelva, Seville, and Cadiz. Huelva uh, here, Seville, and Cadiz. But it seems that this, the culture that seems to, you know, be fairly homogeneous uh, in terms of material culture had an influence that extended inland so, so much as to, you know, Extremadura and southern Portugal. Tartessic material culture, anyway, is best known for a series of emblematic treasures and hordes, right? Uh, such as El Carambolo or la, the one of La Aliceda in Extremadura or other isolated objects. Perhaps things like this winged lion that some think is Tartessic, it's in the Getty, but it's unprovenanced. Other thinks, think it, others think it's uh, Etruscan. But archaeologists have worked very hard to identify and reveal a more complex network of sanctuaries, cemeteries, and some traces of urban uh, settlements with their areas, their own areas of cultivation and, and farms. Though there is no single settlement that is like fully uncovered. At this site, uh, at the site where El Carambolo treasure was found, the first one I showed, several phases of a sanctuary have been excavated. This is one of the few like really exciting uh, sites. The earliest remains were first interpreted as along indigenous, indigenous lines as the purest example of late Bronze Age culture. But later revisions of the materials and further excavation showed that the site is in all its phases purely of oriental cat. For the main excavators, actually, they would say that it's a Phoenician sanctuary. But a lot of, most people will say it's Tartessic. But again, what does Tartessic mean? The constructions date from the mid 8th century to the 7th century and show Levantine traits such as quadrangular architectural layout um, and other traits which are, let's say that the quadrangular layout is different from the typical uh, round hat type of uh, construction that was pretty much the only one known for the indigenous uh, cultures uh, that is continued, say, in, in Celtic uh, culture, right? So other Levantine features of the building were, uh, for instance, whitewashed walls, paved courtyards, uh, one of the courtyards is paved with pink seashells um, as part of the, the area leading to the entrance of the building. And the uh, altars, especially this altar in the form of an oxide sh shape, let's say. Or at least that's how it's called, this one. In turn, the two bronze statuettes associated with the site one of them with a Phoenician inscription suggests this was a sanctuary dedicated to Astarte. The inscription is a dedication to Astarte. And there perhaps, therefore, perhaps Astarte and Baal, since the place has, seems to have two rooms, two adita or sacred spaces with two altars. So that's the hypothesis. Sorry, I was looking at this other slide. <laughs> Here you see a digital reconstruction of what I it may <coughs> uh, have looked like, pretty interesting. Now, these and other finds have brought to light the strong presence of Phoenicians, not just along the coastal colonies and trading posts, but in the interior of the Guadalquivir Valley. So here is Seville, here is El Carambolo, the site I just mentioned, right? The river, uh, of course, the Guadalquivir River is still navigable up to Seville, but the most interesting feature is that in ancient times, we're pretty sure that there was a, an entire gulf uh, that was later um, uh, closed by sedimentation 
after some seismic activity and, and just sedimentation. Um, so today, this is, these are marshes under the Parque de Doñana, it's a national park. And this area seems very interior, but the idea is that in ancient times, this would have been actually kind of a coastal area. Now, more about, about these sites, whether they, are Phoenici they can be Phoenician or, or, or Tartessic or indigenous. Metal resources were, of course, a principal attraction for Phoenicians and others to gravitate towards the western shores. The most famous area is Rio Tinto, the Rio Tinto mines, which are around Huelva. So down here is Cadiz, here is Huelva. The Atlantic area of Huelva and Cadiz had access to local mines, but also served as hinges for Atlantic trade already before formal colonization started. And we know, we know, that, for, well, we know that for sure, but for instance, to show you uh, something famous is the hoard of Atlantic style weapons of bronze uh, found in under the, the harbor of, of Huelva. Now, besides the metal, which is the classical explanation of why the Phoenicians got so far out, there's been another uh, an addition to this interpretation in the last decades, since the 80s actually, for quite a long time. Uh, challenging the inertia to restrict Phoenician activity and impact to the coast and to separate native and Phoenician along, along those axes. This is the idea that there was a, a colonization of the, of the field, an uh, agricultural, agricultural colonization in the hinterland. It uh, was put forth by some historians and a lot of people didn't like it and slowly, slowly has been sinking in that this is also, why not, a possibility. Another key site is that of Carmona, a city near Seville, high up, a high up fortress city near um, a smaller river and dominating a fertile valley. Carmona is best known for its impressive uh, necropolis from Roman times, but it has provided key findings under the city of Tartessic art like this uh, famous pithoi. These were accompanied by Phoenician red slip ware and uh, ivory spoons paralleled only in, in the Carthaginian realm. Now the depiction of griffins and lotus flowers are classic orientalizing motifs, yet distinct in style. There is nothing really like this. It clearly has this oriental taste to it, right? But there isn't an exact parallel to this pithoi anywhere. So, some of these objects uh, were not, some, some see these objects not as prestigious commodities imported by local elite only for display reasons, but rather as the subtle adaptation of Near Eastern motifs within local styles and for local uses that, uh, that go beyond just uh, gift exchange or something like that. For instance, symbols were selected and manipulated and only in some cases we may infer what they mean. In the case of lotus flowers or other symbols uh, associated in the Levant with a start, we might infer, infer that they have to do with what this goddess uh, conveys and uh, in funerary context that might have to do with life and the renewal of, you know, of life after death and things like that, but it's all speculative. In any case, Carmona represents in a sense the proof of a hybrid Phoenician slash indigenous community that we may call Tartessic. Another impressive, uh, this very impressive site is uh, Cancho Roano. This place falls really away from the Phoenician colonial realm proper and yet you would say is purely orientalizing in a sense. So this is here, like in the interior, really, really interior. Okay, apparently an isolated, uh, sorry, I am not showing you the map. Uh, here is Cancho Rano. So in what today is Extremadura, like Southern Extremadura, right? Really far uh, from the Guadalquivir and more near the Guadiana Valley. Uh, so, at, for a long time, this seemed like an isolated building lying at the heart of Extremadura 
built and rebuilt between the 6th and the 4th centuries BC and then closed ritually and covered by a mound in a very interesting way. But recent excavations and surveys of the region are unveiling a much more populated and sophisticated network of communal buildings, all buried under tumuli. It's a very interesting phenomenon that uh, uh, somebody just wrote a dissertation about, so hopefully <laughs> there'll be a good book about it um, along the road, about this network of tumuli from this period. So it's not isolated, and actually I hear that under one of these tumuli there is uh, at least one building that is as impressive as Cancho that they are excavating nowadays. So there is more of this. The building is of striking Levantine or Mediterranean outlook, layout, but its Greek, Punic and indigenous materials suggest a rather eclectic site that served as a religious and economic center, we have to infer, and crossroads for the region. Since uh, the site emerges when the heart of Tartessos in the south declines by the end of the 6th century, Cancerrano possibly illustrates a kind of expansion or secondary internal colonization by Tartessians from the south into a less inhabited area where they recreated their own orientalizing culture. So kind of a secondary orientalizing culture. Another final example of the, of the, of the material culture that we identified with Tartessos are these puzzling warrior stelae, so-called warrior stelae, of which there are um, more than a hundred. There's, there's a big number of them. They are distributed um, all along south, the southwest Spain and uh, Extremadura with some random cases like that one. <laughs> Who knows how that got there? <laughs> These monuments help us trace a Tartessic web and point again to the meeting of Atlantic and Mediterranean traditions. Again, distributed among Andalusia, Castilla-La Mancha, Extremadura and Portugal. Although their, their, their function and meaning of their iconography remains highly debated, they, they showcase a gradual addition and integration of Near, <coughs> near Eastern elements onto earlier autochthonous elements that we would say of, of Atlantic type. So uh, you have Atlantic style shields, helmets and swords, and then you have stelae that start showing chariots, mirror, mirrors, combs and horn figures. This, the stella by themselves are uh, the topic of, <laughs> would be the topic of a, a whole talk. So luxury objects, let's say, that presumably uh, ivory mirrors, or I mean I ivory combs, or silver mirrors, presumably. If the stella are interpreted as markers of Tartessic culture, as, as many argue, their distribution would show that these orientalizing aesthetics reached the hinterland of Extremadura and Portugal from the Guadalquivir, again cutting across regional and later national boundaries. That is a Photoshop. Um, <laughs> uh, there is, uh, they were all found out of context. There is not a single one that is found in its original or near original archaeological context, all reused or just dumped in, in the middle of the fields, which is a pity. So, let's go back to the to Tartessos and the Orientalizing Mediterranean. <coughs> the hybrid culture we call Tartessos then should become especially relevant now as there is a renewed interest in regional studies and Mediterranean networks. This is a, an example of a Tartes Tartessic ivory. A number of uh, works in the last 15 years, uh, some of which you can see in the bibliography I gave you, have created a certain momentum for these cross-Mediterranean studies, right? The corrupting sea, the making of the Middle Sea, and so on and so forth. This perspective emphasizes the interconnectedness within, within and across regions. So along a horizontal axis, but also emphasizes vertical, let's say, continuities running through each area from prehistory, since prehistory. This double contextualization is helpful when looking into this hectic 
multi-directional exchange of the 8th and 7th centuries BCE, as it maintains our focus away from simple diffusionists. Now, as we have seen, the concept of orientalizing has been um, attached to Tartessos since its identification on the ground. It's, it's almost impossible to not use it for Tartessos, but like most academic conventions, the term again is not without its problems. So let me talk a bit more about that. The main one problem is its vagueness, obviously. Orientalizing assumes an orient as an entity, something that sounds very old-fashioned, and hence falls into all the traps of Orientalism, hence obscuring as much as it reveals. The term is still convenient enough and broadly used and accepted. Since that is the case, I've been thinking a lot about it and I think that in some ways I find it appropriate. In what ways? I think that it's fault, maybe it's virtue, that the vagueness that we, uh, our vagueness when we call something orientalizing may well reflect an equally generalizing and opaque conception of what was oriental in antiquity. That is, the intention and the function of these imitations and appropriations went hand in hand with a prestige emanating from the older urban literary civilizations of the Near East. The trend was triggered by the desire of local elites to articulate their own aspirations within their communities and vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors. These aspects have been emphasized by your own Peter van Nommelen in regarding Sicilia, you know, uh, Sardinia and indigenous cultures or other studies about the orientalizing materials. Uh, I like a lot Thomas Brissard's uh, book, is in the bibliography, or Marianne Feldman's work on communities of style. Now, all of those works don't talk about the West, right? They talk about Greece or they talk about the Levant. So, in other words, the Orientalizing movement did not neutralize or does, should not neutralize the, cul the cultural identities of those who eagerly joined this supranational koine. The transformations triggered by the encounter with the Levant run deeper than the artistic varnish, as we see in the case of Tartessos as well. So it's time we kind of bring it into the conversation about what this orientalizing art is. We are dealing with an internal process that is unique to each group, of course, and the lack of historical sources for the prehistory of most of the groups involved is a serious challenge. Be it Tartessians, Sardinians, Etruscans, we can only vaguely delineate the trajectory before they enter the more visible archaeological record in this period. Moreover, Tartessic writing, which is the, the earliest in the, in, in the West, the earliest West of, of the Etruscans, remains undeciphered, despite much work, as some of you know. <laughs> uh, it is virtually impossible to gouge how the orientalizing wave accented or changed the course of these local identities. In short, we should consider the orientalizing phenomenon as an arena open to interpretation to be understood in both intercultural and local terms. We owe the indigenous cultures the benefit of the <coughs> doubt when judging their complexity and possible cultural cohesiveness, at least when such identity is suggested by external testimonia and archaeological data. Fortunately, archaeologists studying the Western Mediterranean are increasingly comparing notes and are compensating for the scarcity of sources with more nuanced interpreta in interpretive uh, efforts. <laughs> um, I would say more earnestly so than classicists have done for the contemporary Greek phenomenon. Classicists have the luxury of written sources and have the luxury of knowing who the Greeks were, sort of. Right? So they don't have to make such an effort to try to figure out uh, a lot of these things. In the case of Etruria, for instance, where traditional archaeology had, um, accent has centered on the use of orientalizing aesthetics in princely and elite contexts, recent voices like Corina Rivas are insisting on the need to pay more attention to social and ideological changes internal to the culture. 
in Sardinia, the scholarship of, uh, of Peter van Dommelen, especially highlights the internal appropriation of Oriental culture in zones of contact with the Phoenician colonies over a long durée. This process spans from the 8th century to practically classical Sardinia, correct? <laughs> when the island is under Punic influence. As we have argued for Tartessos, the orientalizing elements by themselves do not necessarily explain the changes in the indigenous culture. Its roots must be sought much earlier. This is a, this, this is, well, later. This is the really Iberian, uh, Iberian art, but it's interesting. <laughs> and it, it has a, a certain, here you can see some Aegean kind of influences. Now, this manipulation of the Oriental then goes both ways. Right? So another focus of my current project is to help us understand the active role of the Phoenicians at the other end of the rope. These ubiquitous uh, Levantines that we know as Phoenicians thrive precisely because they knew how to provide what their market coveted. They are as deliberate in the process as the indigenous consumers of the orientalizing culture. See, they selectively exploited perceptions of what was international, prestigious, sophisticated. I think they, I think they did. I think there is a deliberate marketing, uh, very successful one of these things. At, the time, at that time of the first millennium, this idea overlapped considerably with what we classify as oriental. Modern efforts to locate the origins of the different oriental models distract us from two things. One, the Phoenician culture had itself appropriated Assyrian and, Egy and Egyptian traits for centuries, which formed part of what was perceived and projected as Phoenician, or Tyrian, Sidonian, or whatever, if we don't want to use Phoenician. After all, the, their culture, well, all cultures are eclectic. Theirs is the m one of the most eclectic ones, but eclectic is kind of an unfair word. I feel like that doesn't do justice of what they would perceive as that's part of their own culture. The second thing is the recipient, the recipient cultures, like say the Tartessians, did not necessarily distinguish among diverse original roots of the new artifacts and soon created local versions of them anyway. So we need to see this phenomenon both from those lenses, the, the local and the Phoenician, and that there is a, a, a marketing of this that really must be mediated by these Levantines. As I said before, I also want to, qu to question the different assumptions about what this phenomenon means in each region. Besides the difference in types of records preserved in each case, uh, interpretive differences correspond in part to historiographical traditions and trends within each discipline and in each country. Inevitably, we work with teleological narratives and make projections onto earlier periods. How can we, to, uh, how can we look at the late geometric, um, wait, I think I, no, I'm still in this slide. <laughs> how can we, uh, let's, let's go back to, well, it's okay. Uh, let's say, how can we, um, these are examples of Greek, uh, orient Greek orientalizing art, the Sphinx and Idean uh, cave plate <laughs> and an Assyrian model, let's say. So how can we look at the late geometric or archaic orientalizing Greece without an idea of Greekness derived from classical Greece? How can we forget the fact that Greek is still considered the cradle of Western civilization? It is not surprising that the Greco-Oriental encounter is downplayed as rather superficial and ultimately inconsequential for the formation of Greek culture and identity, unless we're talking about the, Persian, the Persians. Put differently, complicating Greek culture and identity means not only shaking boundaries between East and West, but questioning the independence and absolute originality of the most valued culture of the ancient world, rethinking what is really a sort of foundation myth of the West. Obviously, much less is at stake when it comes to Iberia or Antartesos. As we have seen, it wasn't even that salient in Spanish historiography or identity until 
the 20th century, beginning with Romantic archaeology. Between the feats of Iberians, Celtiberians, Carthaginians and Romans, little room was left for obscure Tartessos. Still, as a colleague Fernando Wolf has put it, I quote, it served, Tarteso served as a referent of antiquity, a sort of, a sort of remote um, glory, like a removed and ancient relative that provi provides nobility, but not genealogy in the most important sense, that is related to continuity and inheritance. But now, how does this compare, how does Tarteso compare to other orientalizing cultures? I'm coming to the last part. Here is where teleological readings of the visible evidence might be tricking us again. As for other equally vanished cultures, we might ask this. What if Tartessos had survived, survived as a sort of cohesive civilization past the 6th century, as, the, as Greece did, if we had even scraps of its literary traditions and autochthonous narratives? Would we be less prompt to emphasize so much their debt to, Fe to Phoenician colonies and to collapse Tartessic remains with Phoenician ones? Playing with the reverse scenario, let us imagine that the Greek communities of the Dark Ages were not the ancestors of classical Greece, but somewhere else. Um, imagine that we didn't have the literature from them, but only the archaeological record right, of the early Iron Age and orientalizing periods. Would we not study them as one more indigenous culture? After all, Greeks, Tartessians, Tyrrhenians, Sardinians, they all flourished at that time in the 8th, 7th centuries and were profoundly transformed by an unprecedented intensification of contact with the Eastern networks. So compare, for instance, the case of Etruria and how we see it through Roman lenses as the precursor of their culture, of Roman culture. This relationship guarantees for the Etruscans a place in the ladder <coughs> that leads to Western civilization, while Tartessos lacks this historical advantage. And there is still other cultures in the Mediterranean that remain even more marginal and unknown for European academics, academics especially the North African cultures which entered into contact with the Phoenicians the Phoenician colonies at roughly the, the same time as Iberia. The study of Phoenician settlements in North Africa always takes primacy and is seen as more important than the local, uh, local cultures over indigenous developments and adaptations. Right? Despite the proximity and parallel development to some degree of these regions on both shores of the Mediterranean, they remain, the North African ones remain on the other side of a horizontal line of linguistic, cultural and political barriers, as well as of modern cultural valorization. To finish with one, with one last thought, and I think this is why they gave me the NEH grant, <laughs> I hope this conversation really ultimately stimulates self-reflection in a time when issues of identity, of ethnicity and migration are under special scrutiny a time when political conflict is inflected with religious and ethnic overtones and when the rift between East and West, the West and the Levant, is particularly poignant. Thank you for your attention. Tartessos, you mean? <coughs> because I started um, as a classicist, I, I started from Greece and then I was fascinated by the Middle, East, Middle Eastern cultures, modern, ancient, and I found a connection through the Phoenicians, in a sense, because they are in classical sources, they are from the Middle East, and, and that really 
took me to Spain, not because, I mean, I'm Spanish, <laughs> but, but it was really later, it wasn't an initial interest, but then once I was studying the Phoenicians, I was like, oh, I should take a look at the Phoenicians in Spain. And I started researching that area. So I found in, in, <coughs> I found in that, in Tartessos, really kind of a, a very nice, n you know, kind of mystery world. I mean, you have a little bit of everything. You have classical sources, you have uh, archaeology, you have colonialism, you have sem the Semitic element, and all those tensions that I study more generally between classics and Near Eastern studies. Yes, Peter. Uh, well, thank you very much. I thought it was a great uh, talk, and particularly the Tartessos area as a whole has been um, difficult to grasp, and so this really is helping the way through your work trying to, to bring together all of the, the various lines. And I thought it was really interesting, particularly the uh, latter part of your talk. Um, and that's really my question, because where you're saying, well, we would perhaps have a better understanding if we would have more literature, and so we would grasp it better. But I've often been thinking the opposite, <laughs> in, in the sense that it is precisely because of all the, the sort of references and as vague as they are in the literature about Tartessos that people are looking for kind of archaeological evidence that they're never going to find because they're looking for to find textual references in the landscape, which right. is, I would think, a sort of fool's errand. And right. Um, if you compare, for instance, to the area, the later area you talked about, the uh, uh, Cancho Roano and you know how that the work has been done there archaeologically on La Mata and now at Medellin and, and those yeah. sort of places, that's archaeologically very well defined. And the problem is perhaps how to cast it into the sort of textual framework. But it is the textual kind of thing that tends to to expand the frame. And the same with the Orient orientalizing, sort of wanting to see paint really sort of long period overviews, whereas sort of more focused, dedicated archaeological works make sense of things and situations in their local context. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> no, I, no I, I see what, you, yeah, I see what you mean. I mean, I think I say, uh, it's tr I mean, it's true that the moment you have text, you try to impose, I mean, you, you go to sites or two areas with a preconceived idea. Uh, that's what you're, right? Like, so maybe that's, all, that's what I want to, what excites me is to try to look both ways. Like the same way that um, when, basically when it comes to Greece, uh, why can't we look to orientalizing materials or archaic or let's say geometric into orientalizing uh, with a clean mind? It's very hard because you know it's leading towards what's Greek, so you rest importance to what's happening there, or I mean, you rest importance to the the cultural change and the cultural exchange that is happening because, in a sense, it's all leading to something you already know what is going to be. So that's it goes both ways. Like I like us to be like more clear of the text when it comes to looking at the Greek material, and then I like us to perhaps <coughs> think that why not in the West you may have you know, as complex communities or with their own mythologies and literatures and so on that we, we're never going to know, obviously, as you have in Greece, where you, ha you know in the geometric period you have the Homeric poems going around. Obviously, we don't know that there was anything coming close to that. I mean, there is nothing coming very close to that in the world. In I mean, there, you know, but not to rest uniqueness to that, but in a sense, it's almost like uh, we... I uh, think impossible to, we're so cautious in, in going, I mean, interpreting beyond archaeology because we don't have text that, that I think we're sometimes too minimalistic. Like, well, I think communities that generate that type of, uh, in a sense, material homogeneity must have some type of uh, cultural identity, not to say ethnic, which is like a forbidden word anymore, you know? But I really think that we can kind of try to balance a bit more by looking at this period more with a, a comparative eye in terms that a lot of communities are in a similar situation and then that they are coming into contact with these networks and 
that they might be equally transformative, but in all peculiar ways in different areas. See what I mean? And that the common thread, in a sense, is the Phoenician expansion with a very early Greek kind of follow-up on that. But it, com it does come from the East. But it's neither diffus completely diffusionistic nor, I mean, you, I'm trying to find a balance between those things, if it makes sense. Thank Carolina again and have a glass of wine. Thank you.